Good evening, Eagle Nation. <laughs> Georgia Southern prides itself on providing our students the finest educational experiences possible. And opportunities to hear outstanding speakers are just one of the many examples of this experience. Tonight is indeed a very special evening, and I have the privilege of introducing a couple that truly needs no introduction. We are honored to have with us the former President and First Lady of the United States, internationally recognized humanitarians, and a true son and daughter of the great state of Georgia. Jimmy Carter served as President from 1977 to 1981, successful in the Camp David Accords, the Panama Canal Treaties, and the SALT II Treaty with the Soviet Union. He may be most notable for his admirable humanitarian efforts following his presidency. Since leaving office, President Carter has gained a reputation as a tireless champion for social justice. In 1982, he founded the Carter Center, a nonpartisan and nonprofit center that addresses national and international issues of public policy. He is a university distinguished professor at Emory University in Atlanta and is the author of 27 books. On December 10, 2002, the Norwegian Nobel Committee awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to Jimmy Carter for his decades of untiring effort for him. For his decades of untiring effort to find peaceful solutions to international conflicts, to advance democracy and human rights, and to promote economic and social development. President Carter was educated in the public schools of Plains, Georgia, attended Georgia Southwestern College, the Georgia Institute of Technology, and received a Bachelor of Science degree from the United States Naval Academy in 1946. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter has worked for more than three decades to improve the quality of life of people around the world. Today, she is an advocate for mental health, caregiving, early childhood immunization, human rights, and conflict resolution through her work at the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia. A full partner with the President in all the Center's activities, the former First Lady is a member of the Carter Center Board of Trustees. Mrs. Connor served as a distinguished centennial lecturer at Agnes Scott College in Decatur, Georgia from 1988 to 1992, and is currently a distinguished fellow at Emory University's Department of Women's Studies in Atlanta. She is a graduate of Georgia Southwestern College, where she serves as President of the Board of Directors for the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. Mrs. Carter has received numerous honors, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, America's highest civilian honor. She has written. <laughs> she has written five books and continues to travel and speak throughout the world. A mother of four, she has maintained a lifelong dedication to issues affecting women and children. Jimmy and Rosen called a volunteer one week a year for Habitat for Humanity, a nonprofit organization that helps needy people in the United States and in other countries renovate and build homes for themselves. Together, the Carters co-wrote the book, Everything to Gain, which describes their work at Habitat. President Carter also teaches Sunday school and uh, he told us during uh, uh, dinner this evening that he just finished his 603rd, I believe, Sunday school lesson since the presidency. <laughs> <laughs> and both President and Mrs. Carter serve as deacons at the Maranatha Baptist Church of Plains. President and Mrs. Carter have three sons, one daughter, nine grandsons, three granddaughters, two great-grandsons, and four great-granddaughters, and a couple on the way, as I understand. <laughs> We're also pleased to acknowledge that one of the Carter's grandsons, Jamie, is sitting in the front row here tonight. <laughs> Jamie is currently enrolled at Georgia Southern as a junior in our logistics program which, Mr. President, proves that sound decision-making and intelligence truly runs deep in the Carter family. <laughs> President Mrs. Carter, thank you so much for giving us your time and sharing your wealth of experience with us this evening. Welcome to the campus of Georgia Southern University and to the Eagle Nation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming President and Mrs. Carter. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, let me say first of all that we are very honored and pleased to come to this great university. I've known about Georgia Southern since I was a state senator. As a matter of fact, I was chairman of the university committee in the state senate, and later when I was governor, of course, I saw the great work that Georgia Southern was doing, and now Georgia Southern University has made me proud as a president and particularly as a Georgian. So we're glad to come back here. Tonight, my wife and I are going to divide up responsibilities to give you a little bit about our background, the uh, examples we've had of experiencing and meeting people who are great leaders. And then at the end of the uh, program, we'll be glad to answer your questions about any subject that you have, uh, hunting, fishing, farming, <laughs> uh, politics, environment, whatever. And uh, we'll be trying to answer your questions. Uh, before we start, I'd like to say that uh, we've had a lot of different phases in our life. I think one of the best uh, illustrations was a cartoon in the New Yorker magazine not long ago. This little boy is looking up at his father, and he says, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be a former president. <laughs> well, being a president is the only qualification to being a former president, and so I'm glad to be here. This is one of the nice things about being president. I'm going to start off by letting you know about our early life and uh, until I went to be uh, governor. And Rosa is going to talk about how we got to the White House, and we'll divide up the responsibilities after that. Rosa and I were both born in Plains, Georgia, which now has a population of 635. Uh, we still continue to grow a lot, as you can see. Uh, we were both, uh, I was born in a hospital. In fact, if you play Trivial Pursuit, I was the first president ever born in a hospital. And then three years later, I was living next door to the Smith family when Rosa was born. So I was a next door neighbor for her when she was born. Uh, we courted the last uh, year I was in the White House. Uh, the last, last year I was in the Naval Academy, and uh, I asked her to marry me on uh, Lincoln's birthday. That's when she turned me down. <laughs> I persisted. It's one of the most e best examples of my own leadership that I ever had, not to give up on Rosa. She finally decided to marry me, and we got married. And now you see we have 35 members of our family. So we've had a very successful marriage for the last 66 and a half years. <laughs> I grew up on a farm. I lived uh, about two and a half miles west of Plains in a place called Archery. Uh, we had 215 people who lived in Archery, and I was the only family who were white. So I grew up, all my neighbors, all my leaders, my inspirations in life were African Americans, who at that time were suffering under the blight of racial segregation. So I got to know at first hand how wonderful it was to finally see Georgia and the rest of the country come around to treating all our citizens the same. And I would say that that's what I took to the governorship <laughs> and the White House was a desire for, uh, for human rights. I was a peanut farmer and still am, as a matter of fact. Uh, after I left the Navy, uh, after I served on two battleships and three submarines, uh, I came back to Plains. We didn't have any money. We lived on the government housing project. The first total year we were home was 1954. If there are any old farmers here, they'll remember 1954 was the worst drought we ever had. And our total income for the first year I was home was $280 for the whole year. So we were broke, and we didn't know what we were going to do, but we stuck it out in Plains, and we've been thankful for that uh, ever since. Uh, later, I got involved in growing certified seed peanuts. And while I was there, I was on the hospital authority, I was on the county school board, I was a leader of the Boy Scouts, and I was one of the leaders of the agricultural community, the farming community. I later put in a cotton gin, and then a peanut shelling plant, a commercial plant. So all my life and my background has been uh, as a farmer, as a leader in agriculture in Georgia. So this state is in my blood, and my, fam my family have been here since before the Revolutionary War. And we're very proud of Georgia and particularly the, how, how our, education, our education systems uh, in our state. We have uh, been uh, lucky that, to be elected uh, in public office. I was elected in 1962 to the Georgia Senate. Uh, I had the election first stolen from me. 126 people voted alphabetically. A lot of them were dead and in prison, and they couldn't vote, but they still voted against me. So uh, I finally overcame the dead people and was elected to the Senate 
And then a little bit later, I ran for Congress, and I was elected congressman. The other candidate ran, you know, withdrew from the race and ran for governor. Then I withdrew and ran for governor, and eventually I was elected governor. And I really enjoyed being the governor of Georgia, the governor of Statesboro, the governor of Bullock County, as well as all the other places in Georgia. <laughs> After serving as governor for a couple of years, I decided to run for president. And that's where Rosen will take over the county. She'll tell you how we got to the White House. So I want to introduce myself, my, my treasure, uh, partner in life, my wife, to take over the conversation now, and then I'll come back later on. This is Rosalind. Well, Jim and I developed a, a good partnership very early in our marriage. Uh, he was in the Navy, as he said, and um, the first two years we were married, he was only at home on weekends. I had to take care of everything. He thought I could do it, and, and so I did it. Um, <laughs> but, but also, I developed some independence. And I, we, when he'd come home, I could tell him what was going on, and he could tell me what he had been doing. Um, so when he came home from uh, the Navy, it was natural that I would work with, in our farm supply business along um, side by side with him. Um, and then when he, uh, but, and also I studied uh, accounting, and pretty soon I knew um, as much about the business and sometimes more on paper than he did. And I could advise him. I could say, we need to stop buying corn because we're losing money on it. We were, we had, were doing peanuts and cotton and a little bit of corn. And he took my advice. <laughs> um, and then when he campaigned, um, all of our family campaigned. Um, our two sons, uh, two oldest sons, um, had driver's licenses. And so they went in, we all went in different directions. But the youngest son, Jamie's father, Jeff, was too young for a driver's license, so he went with me. And this was something I had never, ever done. And I remember going with Jeff and pulling, we just went from one community to another. We got in the race late, no schedule. And um, Jeff and I would, we would drive up to a town and uh, sit in the car for a few minutes to get up nerve to get out and ask somebody to vote for Jimmy. <laughs> And if they said okay, and they didn't always, if they were, if they were pleasant, and they were not always very nice, um, if they were pleasant, we had a good day. Um, but it became old hat after a while. But, um, and then when, when Jimmy ran for president, we had seven different campaigns going on. Jimmy and me, our three sons, they were all married, and, and then and their wives would go, each go in a different direction. Jimmy's mother, Miss Lillian, and her sister, Aunt Sissy. So we had seven campaigns going all over the country, and we were in every state. And we just slipped up on our opposition. Um, before the other candidates knew it, we had networks all across the country. And so we got to the White House. And um, it's a pretty good place, pretty nice place to live. <laughs> I had to, when we first got there, I had to catch my breath and realize that I was really there. Um, but and it, because it's it's absolutely beautiful and wonderful, a museum, uh, and um, but we get busy. We got busy, and pretty soon it became home. Uh, two of our sons and their wives were there. Amy was there, and we had all been campaigning and been apart uh, for a couple of years, and and so it just became home. And every night um, at the table. Um, you would have the service plate of a former president in front of you when you sat down, and then they would take it away, and we would eat off of Woodrow Wilson's china, which just had a gold border and a presidential seal on it. But you'd get busy and, and not really thinking any more than in the White House. You'd sit down to dinner one night, and here's Abraham Lincoln's plate, <laughs> and it just does something to your insides. <laughs> but, um, Oh, and in the campaign, we all said the same thing. We, we, Jimmy told us we knew all of his, the, the issues, and we would come home every weekend, try to all come home on the weekends, and then we could, Jimmy could tell us what, we could share what we'd all been, do, been doing. 
And uh, then if we had questions that we didn't know the answers to that we'd gotten during the week, Jimmy could fill us in. So that was another thing we did, all saying the same thing all the time, every week. Um, well, we continued to work in partnership when we were in the White House. I had my projects, Jimmy encouraged me in my projects, and I kept with, up with the issues because I'd been out telling everybody what he was gonna do and I wanted to know what he was gonna do. And he said that every night he got off of the elevator, the elevator to go up to the second floor of the White House. I would say, why did you do so and so? You can't read the newspaper and listen to little one or two minute things on TV or the, um, and, and really know what's going on. So one day he got off of the elevator. This was the February of the second year we were there. He said, why don't you come to cabinet meetings and then you'll know what we're doing. And so I went to cabinet meetings. It was not very popular. I got a lot of criticism. First Lady was not supposed to be there. But I went and I didn't stop. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was, it was really interesting because late in the afternoon, almost every day, we would sit and uh, some ro Georgia rocking chairs that we had put on the Truman balcony. We would sit and um, talk about what he had done and what I had done, and it was, it was nice. Um, and I worked on um, mental health was my main issue. I had begun working on mental health when Jimmy was um, governor. I worked on immunization when he was governor, and I worked on both of those things when he was president. And do you know that when Jimmy was elected president, there were only 15 states that required immunization for school, by school age? And the first year we were in the White House, we were able to get it in all 50 states. That was one of my accomplishments I was really proud of. <laughs> um, I worked on women's issues and elderly and volunteerism. I learned a lot. And, um, um, I'll tell you, but I'll tell you more about my mental health work and some of the things that I did in my next segment. It's Jimmy's time now. <laughs> well, Rosa left me in the White House, I think, which is good. Um, well, when I became president, I was uh, prepared for it. I thought I was going to be elected. Although I was the only one except Rosa, perhaps, in the country that thought I was at the beginning. I was the first president who was elected from the Deep South since 1844, I believe. James K. Polk was the last one. And the reason I was able to be considered as equal to the other candidates, and then others obviously later on uh, I beat them all, was because of the civil rights movement. Had it not been for Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. and Andy Young and many others, uh, it would never have been changed so that a Southerner could be considered to be president. So I'm very thankful for that. So this was... So when I was elected governor, I made an eight-minute inaugural speech and I announced to the world that the time in Georgia for racial discrimination was over. And three weeks later, I was on the cover of Time magazine because of that statement. And that was in 1971, so it was still a burning issue, even that late. Uh, later, when I got to be president, I made an announcement in my inaugural address that human rights would be the foundation for our foreign policy. And that every ambassador in the world would be my personal human rights representative to make sure that people in those countries were treated fairly by their leaders. So I was committed, basically, to peace and to human rights. I served in the Navy for longer than any other president since the Civil War except Dwight Eisenhower. So I was a professional naval officer. And I would say that that was one of the reasons that I wanted to have peace. I was willing to offer my life, if necessary, as a naval officer, a submarine officer, to protect my country. But I knew that all the other Navy men and the Air Force and Army and so forth wanted to live in peace. But to use our strength as a military nation to preserve the peace and to protect the interests of our country. So that's what I tried to do. At the same time, I tried to bring peace to others. One of the things that was burning at that moment was the issue between the United States and Panama, which none of your students are old enough to remember, but I had a question from one of the students tonight about the Panama Canal treaties. When Eisenhower was president, he promised that no American flag would be raised over the Panama Canal zone. But they violated that, Americans did, 
and there was a riot that broke out in Panama because of it, and 20 people were killed. And so Lyndon Johnson, the president, promised to have a new Panama Treaty, but they never was passed under him or his successors until I got in office. So I decided that we would have an honest and fair treaty with Panama, which we finally got approved. And that was the biggest challenge, the most difficult things I ever did as a president. Another thing that I tried to do was to bring peace to other people. When I was elected president, there had been war between Egypt and Israel four times in the previous 25 years. And I thought that I should help to bring peace between those two countries. And peace to Israel has been the most burning issue in my life, I'd say, for the last 30 years. To bring peace to Israel and to do so, you have to bring peace to Israel's neighbors as well, including, of course, peace and justice for the Palestinians. We still try to work on that. But we took the... We took two great leaders who were filled with courage and commitment to Camp David, I did. Rosa was there with me. And we spent 13 days at Camp David with Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister of Israel, and with Anwar Sadat, the President of Egypt, who was the greatest leader that I have ever known. And those two courageous leaders brought peace to that region. And when I went out of office, we had two things. One, a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, not a single word of which has now been violated in 33 years. And the other thing we had was a commitment from Israel to withdraw from Palestine, to withdraw from the, from the occupied territories, which they have failed to do. And at this point, we still have a long way to go in trying to bring peace to Israel and justice to the people who live around Israel. That's a project on which the Carter Center, Center still works. Another thing that I realized when I went into office was that we had a real serious problem with uh, China. I went to China for the first time in 1949 on a submarine. And that was just a few months before China overthrew the incumbent leadership and formed the People's Republic of China on my birthday, as a matter of fact, October the 1st, 1949. And I saw then that China was going to be a great nation sometimes in the future. But even when I was elected president, we still did not have diplomatic relations with China. We had been alienated from China for 35 years. So that was another major project that I undertook, was to bring peace between Israel and between China and the United States and to have normalized diplomatic relations. So we did this on the first day of January 1979. In the domestic issues, what we tried to do primarily was to bring order out of chaos. We had a good budget every year. By the way, we haven't had a budget for the United States government now for five years. And we also had a tax reduction every year, and we had the most jobs created every year the four years I was in office of any time since the Second World War. So we had good jobs, a balanced budget, and also tax reductions. So I took what I learned in Georgia to the White House, and I think I, I know I would have been reelected, but in, uh, September, in November of 1979, the uh, Iranians took American hostages and kept them imprisoned then for then until the last day I was in office. And the last three days I was in office, I never went to bed. I never went to sleep. I just negotiated with the Iranians through intermediaries to bring about a release of the hostages. And on the inauguration day when I left the White House, I might say involuntarily retired because of a 1980 election, uh, I found out that the hostages were on the airport in an airplane ready to take off at 10 o'clock in the morning, and they finally took off at noon, five minutes after I was no longer president. But I can say that was one of the happiest days of my life. So we went. <laughs> so we went from the White House with uh, peace in the Middle East, peace with uh, China, a beginning of an end to apartheid in uh, Africa, and with a uh, opportunity for our country to continue with a balanced budget and with tax reductions and also with, with uh, uh, harmony in, 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 the, uh, in the Oval Office. I might say that the things have changed a lot since then. Uh, now the massive influx of money into the political campaigns have brought about an alienation of one person from another. So we now have red and blue states, and we have in each congressional district and in each state the people are divided from one another into partisan Democrats and partisan Republicans. And this animosity carries over into Washington, so that now there's very little cooperation between Democrats and Republicans in the House and Senate, 
or between the Republicans and a Democratic president. That was not the case when I was there, because we didn't have a lot of money to buy commercial that were negative to tear down the reputation of our opponents. And I hope that that time will come to an end in the future. As a matter of fact, when I ran <laughs> when I ran for president against an incumbent president, Gerald Ford, uh, you know how much money we raised from contributions? Zero. We didn't sing a penny, neither he nor I, to run against each other. And the same thing applied four years later when I was challenged by Ronald Reagan. We just used a $2 per person checkoff and hope someday we'll go back to that time when campaigns are financed by contributions from the general public, maybe $2 a piece, so that we won't have these negative advertisements in a divided country. So those are some of the things I learned in the White House. So after I was involuntarily retired from the White House, Rosalind was too, we came home, and Rosalind's going to tell you about the organization of the Carter Center. Rosalind? The organization? Uh, organization, <laughs> foundation, <laughs> beginning? Well, I forgot to tell you when I was talking about the White House that um, we had a baby there too. Uh, Amy was nine, and Chip and, and um, his wife were living there. And the first about six weeks after we moved in, five weeks maybe, James was born and um, lived in the White House with us. It was so much fun. And he's the James of the 47%. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing that I just thought of that's not on my list, when I was waiting, uh, Mrs. Began and I were waiting at the White House for the men to come home from uh, Camp David when, when they had gotten the treaty. And we were standing on the back. It was, it was so emotional. And Prime Minister Began came up and said to Mrs. Began, Mama, we're going to go down in history for this. It was really wonderful. Well, we, um, I, we did establish the Carter Center right after we came home. And um, I had worked on mental health when Jimmy was governor, when he was president. I had commissions. And now I have a really good mental health program at the Carter Center. Um, we work continuously <laughs> to try to overcome stigma and to influence policy. And um, what is so distressing to me is that people don't go for help because of the stigma. And the gun uh, situation now is just making, it's, it's, every time something like that happens, it just does away or hurts what I've been trying to work on for so long, is doing away with the stigma. But today, people with mental illnesses can be treated Mental illnesses can be diagnosed, people can be treated effectively and can recover and lead fulfilling lives in the community. But because of stigma, so many people suffer needlessly. Don't go for help when they have a chance to lead a good life and it's our fault because, we, because of the stigma. It's just so distressing to me and I've worked on it for 41 years now. Um, and I have, I, I have an annual symposium with the top leaders in our country and the different states um, to work on policy issues. Um, Parity has been passed. The Affordable Care Act requires um, coverage for mental illnesses and addiction diseases as a basic treatment in the basic policy um, treatment of illnesses. And that is, it's been a long time coming, and we still have it. It's supposed to take effect in 2014. And, so, and, and the bill also has incentives for um, people to go into the psychiatric profession. There's so few great, great need for psychiatric um, uh, doc, psychiatrists for children. Now we've learned that if we can catch the illnesses when, when children are little, they can um, sometimes mitigate the illness and sometimes it won't even develop. And it's so important now that we have the personnel, we have the psychiatrists and we have, and geriatric, all psychiatrists are in great need now. I, hmm? I, I want you to finish, yeah, but I just wanted to say one more thing. <laughs> we work on, I haven't talked about Tropical diseases. <laughs> it's not. It's not a, I always take longer than wants me to. Uh, we work at the Carter Center, besides my mental health program, we work on 
a lot of things. Jimmy tell you some, but one is neglected tropical diseases. That's 75% or more of our budget. And we have, and I have to, have to hurry. Um, <laughs> guinea worm is one, that's a horrible disease. There were three and a half million cases in 20 countries when we first started working on that. Now there are, um, this past year there were 542 cases in three or four countries, almost all in the Sudan. And um, the month of January, there was not a single case of guinea worm um, uh, reported in any country in the world for the first time ever. That doesn't mean it's over. And we still have to work to do. River blindness, we work at river blindness caused by a tiny mosquito that bites and you go blind after 12 years. We give a, um, medicine that will stop the um, disease where it is and prevent it if you don't have it. Um, we've, we've eliminated it from Latin America, much, much in Africa. Lymphatic filariasis is elephantiasis, um, schistosomiasis, because worms in the body comes from a snail in, in water. Trachoma is um, an inf eye infection, used to be all over our country. It's nowhere in the developed world anymore. Um, and, the, and the main thing we do for that is build latrines, show people how to build latrines. And Jimmy said he used to be known as president of the United States. Now he's known as the, the builder of the largest number of latrines in the world. <laughs> in Ethiopia, we built um, six million? 600,000. Six, 600,000. That's a lot. <laughs> OK, I'm going to let him close this out. <laughs> well, we. When we founded the Carter Center, we decided we would do two or three things. One is to make it nonpartisan, so Gerald Ford and Henry Kissinger and other prominent Republicans have helped us. We also decided that we would take chances on issues that we may not uh, succeed if we thought it was worthwhile. And we decided that we would not duplicate what anyone else was doing if they were doing a good job. So if the United States government or the World Bank or the World Health Organization or the United Nations or Harvard University was adequately treating a problem, we wouldn't, take in, we wouldn't get involved in it. We just fill vacuums in the world. So that's what's led us into dealing with these five tropical diseases that Rosen described to you, which the World Health Organization calls neglected diseases. And each one of them that she named afflicts hundreds of millions of people now. And on an average year, we treat about 20 million people for these different diseases by going into the most remote villages, into desert areas and into jungles, and training people how to deal with these uh, afflictions on themselves. In addition to that, the Carter Center tries to promote peace between warring countries, sometimes uh, civil wars inside of a country. We go into those countries and negotiate, uh, mediate between them to bring about an end to a war, or prevent a war. We also go to areas that are not visited by our own government. And this is a very serious problem because we have some of our most serious challenges to America's safety and to our well-being from people with whom we won't even talk to. Uh, we had a discussion this afternoon uh, about North Korea. Uh, Rosa and I have been to North Korea. I've been there. I was there last year. I was there earlier in 1994. And uh, our government won't talk to the people in North Korea, but the Carter Center does. We have the same problem in Cuba. Rosa and I go to Cuba when we get ready, and we, uh, no other president has ever been to Cuba, and we still have an embargo against the 12 million people in Cuba, and we're punishing them because even though they're already punished under a dictator, and this is not compatible with my idea about peace or human rights, we also go to all the players in the Middle East peace process. We meet with uh, Fatah and Hamas among the Palestinians. We meet with the Israelis. We meet with the Lebanese, with the Jordanians, with the Egyptians, and others to try to bring about peace, even though our own government won't talk to those people if they are kind of unsavory people. We also have helped to bring about an election in Nepal, even when our country wouldn't talk to the people who won the election. So we try to bring peace to people and also bring, bring uh, ease, ease their affliction from diseases. The last thing I'll mention is that we try to promote freedom and democracy. We've just finished our 94th troubled election that the Carter Center has monitored. 
and we were the ones that started that process. We are, have been in, ha and will continue to be in Egypt. We were in Tunisia. Uh, we were in uh, Libya. We, we've been in other countries as well around the world to bring about democracy and freedom. So those are the kind of things that the Carter Center does. So you can see that we have a busy life, a very productive life, uh, a very enjoyable life, unpredictable, adventurous, and in the long term gratifying. And one of the most gratifying things we do is to come to people like you. As, as uh, your president has already pointed out, I, I'm in my 31st year now as a professor at Emory University. I can't think of any place I'd rather be unless I was a professor at Georgia Southern. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and now we'll have your question. And thank you both very much. Um, I think Dr. Keel's working on the faculty contract. Uh, we can have chairs for both of them um, at Georgia Southern. We do have some students um, who participated in an essay contest to ask questions this evening. Our first student is Jacoby Carpenter. Jacoby is a junior management pre-law major from Waynesboro, Georgia. Uh, I want to thank you again both, sorry, President Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter. Uh, my question tonight is, as the true humanitarians you both are, how do you manage to keep your spirits high and motivated while working with social issues? And what advice would you give to other social justice advocates as well as human rights advocates when they let their empathy side get the best of them sometimes? <laughs> well, there's no difference really between a person's private uh, ambition in life or what you learn in church, no matter what religion you might uh, have, or what you do with your professional life as a school teacher or a lawyer or whatever, or what you do if you're elected to public office. There are basic moral principles that apply, and most of those moral principles are not uh, constraining. They don't put you in a prison, but they liberate you. When you adopt certain moral principles that you learn here at this great university or otherwise, and you apply them to your life, it gives you a new sense of uh, self-confidence, a new confidence in yourself, and also gives you inspiration to go and, and share your life with other people. And that stretches your heart and stretches your mind and gives you a, a life that is, uh, I'd say, unpredictable and adventurous and gratifying, and, and also a, a life that you can consider to be a success. And of course, the things that we look upon as success quite often are not just making a lot of money or living in a big house or having two or three automobiles, but how your life is invested in the well-being of other people. So I would say there's no, no conflict in a person's life, in a profession, in an educational institution, in a law firm, in a business, or in public life. Just do the best you can, reach for greatness, and you'll achieve greatness if, as long as you Put other people ahead of yourself. Thank you. And I get very tired sometimes, and when I do, I just turn down invitations for a while. <laughs> and and but but I really don't. The, we're doing such exciting things, and the diseases, for instance, that we're working on in Africa. Uh, so much is coming to fruition now if we've been working on it for so long. For instance, we've um, eliminated uh, trachoma from Ghana. So I get tired of going to Africa, and next time I'm right there because something good happens every time I go. And it's, it's, just, it's just an exciting life. And I think that as long as you're doing things, particularly if you're doing something that helps other, somebody else, just makes you feel good. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Kelsey Keene. Kelsey is a junior English political science double major from Savannah, Georgia. 
first, I just want to thank you so very much for being with us today and for coming to speak um, to Georgia Southern. And from there, my question is, given the current gridlock in Washington, do you still find politics to be a significant method of creating change? Or would you more encourage today's generation to pursue reform, to pursue, excuse me, reform through nonprofits and foundations? Well, I've already pointed out the gridlock that's in Washington that did not exist when I was there. In fact, it's only been about the last 12 years when Democrats and Republicans can't talk to each other in Washington, where an incumbent president can't talk to the members of Congress on the other, in the other party. But I would say that the, there's no way to avoid uh, the importance of decisions made at the political level, particularly in a democracy. So what our country does in the future will certainly depend on the input of students who are here at this university and at others, the, the next generations that are coming along. And my hope is that you will see that you have a great responsibility to promote peace. We Christians worship the Prince of Peace. But if you look at the history of my country, which I really love, ever since the Second World War, we've been constantly at war, almost, always with the exception of one four-year period when we didn't win at war. But uh, we were in the Korean War, the Vietnam War. We went on then to Cuba. We went to Lebanon. We were in war uh, in uh, Grenada. We were in war in Panama. We were in war in Bosnia. We were in war in Iraq. We were in war in Afghanistan. And that's one thing that our students could do is say, how can we meet, meet our international goals without using our military forces to accomplish that. A military force should be to prevent war, not to cause war. Another thing is we can make sure that we have justice in our country. <laughs> there are a lot of things that we can do to have justice in our country. For instance, when I left office, uh, we had um, very few people in prison. And for every person who was in prison, when I left the White House in 1980, we now have seven different people in prison. We have seven times as many prisoners as we did then. So instead of depending on rehabilitation and preventing people going to prison, we now put in people in prison and leave them there, three strikes and you're out, they stay into the rest of their lives. We also need to have uh, a, a, another, a country that depends on and, and is a champion of human rights. So I think human rights, peace, justice are the things that young people can do. And you don't have to be in politics to do it if you're in a democracy, but it's the politicians who ultimately will have to make the decisions. So stay in close touch as you can with your president, with your congress member, with your governor, with your legislators, and with the Georgia U.S. senators, and let them know how you feel collectively or not. And I can tell you there's no way to, to overestimate how important it is for a member of the U.S. Senate who's going to make a crucial vote to get a letter signed by 15 members of the student body here at Georgia Southern. So don't underestimate your influence. And in the future, I would say run for office, and you can make the decisions yourself. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brittany Bullock. Brittany is a junior political science major from Augusta, Georgia. Thank you again for being here tonight. It's a great honor to hear both of your experiences and successes in life. As a leader, you're sometimes faced with issues that may not align with your personal values. What advice can you give to leaders on how to balance their personal beliefs in the event that they conflict with the views that the, of those who they lead? Well, you know, ordinarily, as I mentioned in my previous answer, you don't find any conflict between your personal values, your religious beliefs, your duties as a citizen in a democracy, or your duties as a leader who's been elected to some public office, either mayor or city councilman or county commissioner or, or, the, or, the, or school teacher or whatever. There's no in, inherent uh, incapability or incompatibility. I, I mentioned in my um, press conference this afternoon here in Statesboro that there's just one issue, for instance, I'll give it to you not to be bragging about myself because I don't know if I made the right decision, but because it illustrates the point, uh, and that is the subject of abortion. 
I never have believed, I'm a Christian, I never have believed that Jesus would approve abortions unless they were, <laughs> unless they endangered, uh, unless the birth endangered the life of a mother or if the pregnancy was caused by rape or incest. And so when I was elected president, I was sworn to uphold the laws of America as interpreted by the Supreme Court. And as you know, Roe versus Wade permits unlimited abortions in the first trimester or until the late baby is viable. Well, I had to enforce the law. So how did I reconcile it? I can't say that I did a good job. But so I did it, uh, comply with the law, but I tried to do everything I could to minimize the need for or desire for abortions. So I studied what other countries do about this. The United States at this moment has about 20 abortions for every 1,000 women who are 18 to 44 years old, about 21. Uh, Denmark and, and I'd say uh, Norway and Sweden have five for every 1,000. So they have about one-fourth as many abortions as the United States. Uh, Russia has about 50 per 1,000. So one of the main things you have to do is to find out what causes people to have abortions. I'd say there are two or three things. One is a lack of knowledge about family planning, about the use of contraceptives. Secondly, you have to be sure that the mother and the prospective child, that the mother knows that when she has a baby, that she can take care of it. So we had a new program that I introduced as president that the Congress passed called Women and Infant Children to provide special help for women that have infant children and are not able to care for themselves. And the third way is to make uh, adoptions easier. So I tried to study everything I could to make sure we minimized abortions, but I've never felt comfortable with laws that permitted abortions uh, just as a means of, of uh, contraception too late. So that's been a conflict in my life. I think it's the only one I remember that has bothered me between my own religious beliefs and, and moral values and what my duties were in public office. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jacqueline Amison. Jacqueline is a senior marketing and sales management major from Athens, Georgia. Hello. Hi, Jacqueline. How should current and future business leaders work to preserve natural resources when the market and competition all reward businesses for increased use of these resources? Well, obviously, every business that's in the process of taking natural resources and developing them into a product that the consumers will buy uh, has to face that basic question. And there are two or three things that can be done. One is that the people who do, uh, say, make, take Georgia's pine timber and make uh, pulpwood out of it. Uh, that used to be the number one source of uh, air pollution in Georgia. And we passed very strict laws about that when I was governor and, and since then as well. But the business leaders should realize at that point that they have an obligation to the public and they should spend a little bit more in purifying their process so that they don't put CO2 and, and, CO2 and sulfur dioxide into the air unnecessarily. I would say that people who produce oil can very well produce it without, with a minimum of adverse effect on the environment. And of course, they can avoid oil spills. Uh, also, the government has a responsibility to make sure that some basic rules are made not to restrict uh, the, the production of goods but to make sure that the production is compliant with air and water pollution standards and, and, it, and avoids the kind of oil spills, for instance, that we had in the Gulf of Mexico a couple of years ago. So I think there has to be a combination of a business leaders, uh, whoever they might be, saying we will do our share to prevent air and water pollution, and at the same time the government putting restrictions to make sure that there's uniformity so that one, I would say, enlightened business leader who wants to say, I'll protect air pollution by spending a lot of extra money on my product is not put at a disadvantage when he tries to sell his products that might cost a little bit more on the marketplace than if he didn't do a good job. So I think that one of the things we have to remember is 
that the, that the environment is something that belongs to all of us, and every citizen in America should be very much aware of the fact that we have a limited amount of natural resources. We ought not to waste them. Secondly, that if you're producing goods, as you pointed out in a business, that we have a, an obligation to be uh, protective of the environment and also comply with the laws that are passed with very great difficulty by the Congress to put uniformity in this country. There's no easy answer. It's just a matter that everybody's in it together. And the ones that will suffer most is not us. It's our grandchildren and, and great-grandchildren who will have to come along uh, at a time when global warming might become a very severe threat to our very existence. That's coming along in a few generations ahead of us. I think we should accept the fact that this is a scientific fact, and we should start thinking about it constructively now and in the future. Our next question is from Chase Lacani. Chase is a freshman electrical engineering major from Buford, Georgia. Good evening, Mr. President. I thank you for coming to Georgia Southern. My question is, you were in one of the world's most recognized leadership roles and in the media spotlight constantly. What was it like to return back to citizen life the day you <laughs> stepped out of office? Uh, I was not nearly as unhappy as my wife was. <clears throat> <clears throat> in fact, much, Rosen, is much, Rosen is much more of a politician than I am. And uh, I spent a lot of time after we were defeated trying to think of uh, excuses or reasons why we could have a good life to make my wife feel better because she was grieving much more than I was grieving. Well, I, there was an element of liberation. And I have to say that my own time in public office has been very brief compared to most uh, members of, uh, of the White House, most, most presidents. I was just in the State Senate when I, I ran for State Senate when I was 38 years old. I served four years in the Senate, four years as governor, and four years as president. So I've only had a close of 12 years in public life. So you can see that 12 years out of 88 years is a very tiny part of my life. So I've had much more experience as a private citizen than I have in public office. But I think when I left the White House, I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, I did do an analysis, and I realized that, that my age, 56, my life expectancy was 25 more years. And uh, what was I going to do with my life? And I have to say that the best time of my life has been since I left the White House. And part of that is because I was in the White House, because all the things that the Carter Center does now in more than 70 different nations is made possible for me and Rosa because we were the first family of America. We were the first family of the greatest nation on Earth. So that gives us access to almost anybody in the world, foreign leaders who are now incumbent in, in office in all the countries, scientists, medical specialists, environmental specialists, anybody we want to work with us almost, we can get them to do so. So having been in office is one of the best things that happened to me, and being out of office has been the happiest time of my life. So I've had a mixed blessing. I've had a blessing both ways. He was right about me. I grieved. <laughs> um, and, but he was my husband, and he had been hurt. And that, I think it was natural for me to grieve about that. But also, we had the country going in the right direction, that we were at peace. He was working on environment. He was working on education. Um, just things that now we are going, we're bringing up again after all of this time. Um, and so I just knew he would have been a better president, and I still know he would have been a president than, than the one that followed us. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> and so I think I was all right to grieve. You, you can see who the politician is in the family. <laughs> Our next question is from Annalisha Listenbeck. Annalisha is a joint enrolled student at Georgia Southern and Statesboro High School, and she's from Statesboro, Georgia. All right. What inspired you both to run for President of the United States? <laughs> Before entering politics, did you, President Carter, ever consider running for President? 
At what moment did you decide to run? And what was your initial reaction to President Carter's decision to run for president, Mrs. Carter? Okay. Oh, uh, that's five questions. Can we take our choice? <laughs> and Alicia, that's, those are good questions. Let me, let me answer them quickly. Uh, when I left the Navy, I had no intention of ever running for office. And then it was nine years later that I just started to run for the state senate. When I was elected to the senate, I had no idea of running to any higher office. And then I decided to run for Congress, and then later I decided to run for, for governor. When I ran for governor, I had no idea of ever running for public office again. And uh, at that time, Georgia's governor could only serve four years. And it was after I'd been in office for two years that I decided to run for president. And every time, my reason basically was that I wanted to use my influence or knowledge or experience or background uh, in order to serve more people. And to, do, and to try to implement my ideas about what government should be uh, on a higher level. So that's why I decided to run for office, was to try to use whatever talent or ability or opportunity I had for the benefit of more people. I'm not trying to be altruistic or unselfish about it. And I have to say that there was a need, too, in my life to occupy a higher office. I was very glad, glad for the recognition and the honor when it came. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I decided to run for state senator, I didn't even ask my wife about it ahead of time. I went home from the field, uh, started taking off my blue jeans and putting on a suit, and my wife said, Jimmy, who, who's dead? <laughs> uh, whose funeral are you going to? And I said, I'm going over to the courthouse to qualify to run for the state senate. That's the first time she knew it. But our life changed after that. So from then on, I had to get approval and permission from Rosen to run for governor and for president. And, and I'll, I'll let you, her tell you why she approved. And I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine Jimmy running for president. I sat in at all of the meetings, and I tried to tell my mother that Jimmy was going to do that. And I said, Mother, Jimmy's going to run for. I couldn't even say the word. <laughs> Jimmy couldn't either. I, I went to tell my mother, I said, Mom, I'm going to run for president. She said, president of what? <laughs> <laughs> but and I wanted to, uh, let me tell you this to the young people who are here. We had a teacher when I was in school, J Jimmy's favorite school teacher. He quoted her in his Nobel Prize um, uh, remarks and inauguration. Um, but she used to come in our room, even when I was in grammar school, and say, Remember, any young man in this room could be president of the United States someday, so study hard. Well, I want to tell you that I'm going to say mine in a little, different, a little differently. Any young person in this room can be president of the United States. Any young man or any young woman in this room can be president of the United States. So study hard, study hard, and prepare. I don't think Jimmy ever dreamed. I never dreamed I'd be first lady. I don't think he ever dreamed he'd be president. You never know what the future holds, so study hard and be prepared. Thanks. You heard that study hard piece, right? <laughs> President and Mrs. Carter, um, all week long, we've had a social media feed of questions as well. So our final question tonight comes from that social media feed. Since we are here at Georgia Southern, it says, they want to know what, your, what impact your Southern upbringing had on your presidency and your life in the White House. <clears throat> Well, first of all, I think the South is known as the Bible Belt, and the impact of our religious faith and the fact that our entire community is uh, deeply religious had an effect on me. And I've already mentioned that I grew up in Archery, Georgia, which is not, uh, not incorporated, where all my neighbors were African Americans. And I have to say that uh, coming out of the South, I knew intimately my African-American friends, and was not, it was not difficult for me to understand their needs, and I was able to get their support when I ran for president. 
I could go into an African-American church and uh, preach a sermon and feel at home there or teach a Sunday school lesson. And so I think that the knowledge of the damages of violation of civil rights or human rights helped me. And the fact that I was deeply religious helped me as well. And the fact that in the South, you have to accommodate different kinds of people and get to know them and respect them. And I, as I mentioned in the press conference this afternoon, that's one of the prime symbols of a, of a leader, is whether you can uh, uh, attach yourself to your own deep moral and ethical values and beliefs, and at the same time respect people who disagree with you. Not only respect them, but treat them with dignity and, and treat them as a friend and work harmoniously with them. So, so I think those three things, religious faith, understanding the importance of equality of opportunity in a society between black and white and others, and at the same time respecting people who disagree with you, those are the three things that I think I got from the South. Thank you all very much for letting us come, and now my Rosa, Rosa wants to have a final word. No, I was just thinking about when we moved into the White House and we're having the first state done, and I was very nervous about whether I would follow protocol. And um, so the military, they have military that, that give you lessons in protocol. <laughs> we, had, we rehearsed how we would act, and I was told repeatedly that the head, first lady of the head of state would be on my right. And um, so then we got in the receiving line, and my first lady, the first lady was on my left. And I said, I mean, I just decided that Southern hospitality is all that protocol is, and I relaxed and enjoyed the rest of it. It's been wonderful to be with you. Thank you. Let me say one other thing. When, when Rosen first visited the White House, uh, they went in and, and they, they, they said, uh, uh, how are you, are you going to be able to cook for the Carters? And the servants said, we've been cooking the same thing for each other, and I'm sure the Carters will eat the same thing the servants eat. So, so th that's another thing we got from the South, was being able to eat Southern food in the White House, because the servants all ate the same thing we did. We've had a wonderful time tonight. Thank you for letting us come. God bless you all. President, Mrs. Carter, thank you for your time with us tonight.